Today we've got a special guest, uh, another superhero in the community, somebody I've been fortunate to meet, know, and co-create with. I have the wonderful, esteemed cannabis legal guru of not just New Jersey, states, and now the world. <laughs> Is that fair? Welcome. Fair. Thank you. What's Happy happening? to be here. What's your name? Jess Gonzalez. Jessica Gonzalez. With who, what do you do, high level? Sure. So I wear a few hats. So on the private sector side, I work for a law firm. I do cannabis and trademark work. I, on the government side of things, I'm a consultant to the New Jersey Business Action Center Cannabis Training Academy. On the academic side of things, I'm an adjunct professor at Hudson County Community College and Rowan University, teaching history of cannabis and cannabis policy. Wow. And then I also have my own uh, cannabis consulting business as well. And I'm a policy advocate. There's, um, you have the same 24 hours in a day that I have. This is true. You do? So mm -hmm. how, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you do all these things? It's all in the same atmosphere. Everything with the same purpose and mission to push forward the conversation of equity in cannabis. So what I do at the firm is I educate clients on protecting their intellectual property assets. What I'm doing with the state is helping to build out an educational course on cannabis. My teaching, I obviously teach. And part of my advocacy work is also empowering other people to become their own best advocates. So it all just comes down to teaching, which is and, what I love. Uh, when did you when did you start and how did you get? I mean, silly question, but just to you know, for anybody that doesn't yeah. know, do you smoke weed? Been smoking weed since I was seventeen. I got no plans to stop. <laughs> <laughs> seventeen. Where'd you grow up? Jersey City. Jersey City. City the Heights. Yes. The Heights. The Heights. Shout out to uh, Councilman Youssef, uh, head head and honcho of the Heights. That's right. Um. Uh, so you grew up in Jersey City. Uh. I guess you, where'd you study law? So I went to college and law school up in Boston. So I did leave Jersey City for about seven years. And then back in 2016, after I graduated, I came back. And when did you decide I want to be a lawyer? You know, I'm still trying to remember the day when I went from, I'm going to be a journalist to I'm going to be a lawyer. But this really? shift happened around when I was 16 years old in high school. I can't exactly pinpoint the day that it happened, but it happened. You want to be a journalist? Yes. So I grew up doing a lot of creative writing that, you know, I was a five-year-old writing stories. I won a lot of publications. I got what? published in Time Magazine when I was 13 years old, talking about me coming here, you know, as an immigrant. So I was really moving forward with being a creative writer and a journalist. And then, I I'm, like I said, I'm not so sure, you know, where the, the shift happened. But one day I was trying to really figure it out. So I did an exercise of asking myself why I became a lawyer, but asking myself seven times. So why I became a lawyer? Well, because, you know, I want to know about the law and I want to be able to protect myself. Why do I want to protect myself? And I just went down this rabbit hole. And then I remember that, you know, or recognize that I grew up in a very, what I perceive to be a threatening environment. And I looked at the laws. It pervades everybody's life. It touches every area of life every single day. So if I could equip myself with those tools to defend myself in a world that I thought was threatening, and perhaps I could make it out of here alive and successful. Holy shit. Yeah. When, when, when did he do that seven time? Why am I becoming a lawyer? I thing? did it about two years ago when I was really trying to figure out why I entered this field. And I was really trying to determine like what, what was that shift? What happened really around 15, 16 that I just decided to, you know, Journalism, not going to cut it out for me, but maybe, you know, a legal... Not going to cut it out. Well. You're published on time. Right. Right. How many books you got? <laughs> I got to ask. I don't know. Like, how many I, books, like, have I... Yeah, have you written? written? How many... You know? I have not written any books, but that is a very big goal of mine, is to become a published author. I've published a lot of articles, um, but even poems, uh, but not books just yet. Talk to me about what you were doing at 15 and 16 years old. 
15, 16 years old. Well, I went to McNair. So shout out to McNair High That's School. That's the Cougars? That is the Cougars. That's the Cougars, right. Yes. And uh, there I was, I took, you know, the writing classes, you know, AP English, AP writing, you know, those were always the classes really that I wanted to take. And then when I was about, yeah, between 15 to 16, I saw there was this writing program happening in uh, Massachusetts. And it was really expensive, but they were offering scholarships. So I just figured like, fuck it, like, why not? Let's try it out. And I got accepted and I got accepted full scholarship. So this is my first time really living outside of New Jersey. And so I was 16 years old and I went to a three week writing program. And I had never, and I was the only person of color. How was that? So coming from Jersey City and McNair, where the majority is minorities, yeah. it was very strange, but it showed me a completely different world. So I came back home and I said, I'm leaving New Jersey the first chance that I got. And that's why I really wanted to go to Massachusetts because this writing program really showed me some really wonderful things. Oh, that was so the catalyst. That's how you got to, uh, tell me about like, and again, I'm, I'm going back to, to where it started, right? Because that's what really defines us yeah. now. When, when's like the earliest re- recollection you have of like just creative writing? Because the the thing that I think about is Hudson County. You're thinking about writing, like liberal arts, to be yeah. Like my fr- one of my earliest memories was my mother attended Hudson County Community College. Did she? Yeah. And during the summer, she would take summer courses, and she obviously had nobody to look after us, so she would take me to her classes. And she, I basically would just ask, I just need a piece of paper and a pencil. And they would sit me in the corner. And as my mom is taking her classes, I would just write short stories. And so my mom has a collection of all of these short stories that, you know, I would be writing. And I remember that one of her professors came up to me and said, this is wild that a five, six-year-old could sit here and write a story you know, and there was a whole arc, right? There are main characters, the whole little, you know, plot, everything. And that really encouraged me a lot to really move forward. And then throughout grammar school, I was always the one writing like all these stories, submitting them for publication. Teachers would have me read it out loud. You know, like what seventh grader is writing like a 10 page story nope. when, when the, Not you know, here. they're really asking for two pages here. So that's how, yeah, that's how it really started. My mom always really encouraged a lot of my writing um, and it's, what I've used a lot, I think, in terms of my legal career in my advocacy has been my ability to story tell. tell stories. Yeah. She, you said she uh, she's collected them? Mm-hmm. My mom has somewhere? collected them. They are somewhere. Can you share, like, one, one of them? Like, a fun one or Yeah, you know, one, one? one story that I wrote, and I find this to be just a little strange for, for a 12-year-old, but I actually <laughs> wrote a, a story called The Tree Carving Death about reincarnation and what? about these two individuals who just happened to find themselves in one life but then had recollections of meeting in a prior life, and they met by this tree, this tree that meant a lot to them in one life, and then also their new meeting place in a new life. So I wrote it all about that. So that's probably one of my favorite stories. Oh my God. So, so many questions. Uh, Movies, were you watching a lot of movies as a kid? Yes. My mom, big movie buff, but these are the types of movies that she was always showing us. She was always showing us movies about the underdog, about moving ahead. So like, think like Men of Honor, think Rudy, think Coach Carter, uh, think... um, Dangerous Minds, so always also about teachers, right, freedom writers, things like that, of really going to these neighborhoods, these kids who really just didn't have the best, um, you know, advantages, but how they transformed their lives through different ways or through different people. So my mom was always sending us the message, like, you, we may be the underdogs, you know, we didn't really grow up with a lot of money, um, my mom had to work really hard, she sacrificed a lot, but we can still make it. If we work hard. What's, so uh, that was the work ethic. If I may ask, what's your mom's name? My mom's name is Sylvia. Sylvia, shout out to Sylvia. Shout out to Sylvia. By the way, I need to try your fritada. You <laughs> keep posting it. I'm Ecuadorian as well. And I hate seeing fritada so close to me. 
cooked yet so far. She does make some bomb fritada. La no, but, I'll bring uh, some. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really, like, shout out to your mom for real. <clears throat> so in these conversations, I'm trying to understand what made you incredible people so, so incredible. Um, and what we're starting to find out, there's, like, this commonality of the surrounding community or the influence mm-hmm. that is peddled. And, I, I, you know, for some people that might seem obvious, but then, you know, when you look at certain communities and how people don't have access to things, and then when I hear the incredible backgrounds of, of folks like yourself, like your mom, like, was that catalyst for you, that influence for you, that encouragement for you, that had had that not been the case, had Massachusetts not happened, would you be a lawyer? today probably still fighting for some cause it seems because it's you know my mom is a big fighter i've never seen my mom really back down from is, she, is she short she's short like me so you know, uh, uh, I don't know some people are short when i go so but fight. she's always had a lot of fight in her and so either whether it was like standing up to somebody who like cut her in line or, you know, like standing up to certain family members, she was always standing up for something, even at like her job, she had difficulty. Like she had no problem ever standing up to anybody. So I witnessed that, you know, I grew up seeing a fighting spirit and I saw her working so hard, sacrificing so much. And I looked at that and I was like, it was just so empowering to me because that's what made me feel safe. So she created this sort of safety net in an environment where I didn't really feel particularly safe because I grew up with a lot of gang activity around me. You know, I remember hearing gunshots when I was four or five, six years old. I remember our house constantly getting broken into. I remember coming home and everything would just be, you know, chaotic. And so I didn't feel comfortable in any, like a lot of the apartments that I grew up in at all. A lot, some of them were like rodent infested. But if you think about the fact that I just remember having a lot of contact with police like I, I was very familiar with dialing 911 when there were gangs, you know, outside and there were people fighting. I remember the punches on the walls because my bed was right by it, you know? So I remember all of these things and I never really felt safe, but she made me feel safe through like just her, you know, just her actions and how she protected herself really. And then how she advocated for herself always. And as a, uh when I was pointing at you, I was like, that's it. So, you know, before we, before we got online, uh, we were talking about your public speaking. And uh, what was it about how people, when you speak in the panel, everybody's very, uh, and then when you come in, it's, uh, now I understand where the fire comes from. There is. It's a lot of lighting, you know, the fire under, you know, people's asses. Uh, but I think it's also because I seek to empower and to motivate. And a lot of times when I'm on panels, I think everybody has to, you know, they feel this sort of pressure to be very, I don't Mm. know, very proper, very robotic, very mechanic. But I remember seeing a lot of people on these panels, people being recognized. And I would look at that and I'm like, you don't talk like that. So there wasn't a lot of realness that I ever saw on stages or panels. So I remember saying like, if I ever get the chance to be on a stage or on a panel, I'm going to talk the way that I talk. I curse a lot. I talk in a very certain way because I want to make people see like, Hey, she's up there talking the way that I talk. She comes from where I come from. She kind of looks like where I like how I look like. And so that I think really has informed my speaking style a lot. And that I never want somebody to say, like, I didn't learn anything from her. So if one person tells me I learned one thing from you or you motivated me or you inspired me to do this, then that's lit. Yeah. Um, Wow. All right. Cool. You know, that was easy, Bob. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Your creative uh, creative genius. So you went to, uh, let's follow the trajectory. So you come back from Massachusetts. You're like, it's a wrap. I'm out of Jersey. Did you just apply to Boston schools or were those the only ones? Most of the schools were abroad. I did get, you know, I did apply here to some schools in Jersey. um, Some who, you know, full rides, full scholarships that my mom begged me to take. And everything in my being said, no, I have, you know, I have to get out of here. I have to see something different. And, you know, I'm I'm really, I'm not going to lie. I resented where I grew up. I resented my Latinidad. 
Mm. I resented the fact that I was an immigrant. I resented all of it because I used to see other people getting these amazing opportunities or having, you know, the cooler sneakers or having, you know, these phones that, you know, I didn't have, right? So I would be made fun of for certain, you know, clothing, you know, that I would wear. I never had, you know, any sort of high tech type of gadgets. I didn't have brand name clothing. A lot of the clothing and that's still that I wear are hand me downs from my cousins. Oh uh, yeah. And so I can resonate, so just just want to make sure yeah. that like you, you weren't alone in that. Yeah, and so when when that happens, you sort of feel like especially like a teenager, you're like, Well, this sucks that, you know, I'm being treated this way and that I don't have the resources, you know, that other people have. So when I looked at going to a school like Boston University that was extremely expensive, you know, it's a private school, I always thought it's not fair that only people with money should go to these schools. Like I always like that never sat well with me. So I was 17 years old and I told my mom, I don't care how many loans I have to take out. I'm going to Boston University. Like I'm leaving. I'm going to that school. And my mom fought me on it for about a week. We fought back and forth, you know, just mainly financial. And also she wanted me to stick around somewhere closer as most, you know, Latin families want. And one day she told me this, she said, I, she says, you have to fight for what you want, even if you have to fight me. And so that's what I did. I fought her and I fought for where I wanted to go because to me, it seemed like a completely different world that I wanted to be a part of. And so much so that in high school, a high school teacher took me aside and said, I heard you're going to Boston University. I want you to be aware of what you're walking into. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, this school and this city gives you a false sense of what reality is like. <laughs> because at, at our high school, the white people were the minorities. Yeah. So he said, listen, the world is white. And I said, yeah, I watch TV. I've seen it. And he said, no, Jess, it's going to be different for you. And it was. It was like extremely terrifying to go there and not see anybody like myself at all. How is that? It was hard. Like, it was like, hard. And was, I, like from the, when you first got there to over time? It was hard in the beginning. Um, I was texting a lot of my friends. I felt very homesick. I felt like there wasn't a lot of support for students like myself who are like the first to go to a private university, coming from an immigrant family, coming from a place where I've never seen as many Caucasian people. It's just like I couldn't even believe that there were so many of them. And I didn't know how to talk to them. I didn't know if how to relate to them. I had, you know, no idea. Like these were these were kids whose families, you know, are doctors, are are lawyers. I remember asking some of them about financial aid, and they're like, "What's a FAFSA?" It's like, "What's a FAFSA? What do you mean, what's a FAFSA?" <laughs> so I couldn't even believe wow. it. And I remember why I was, you know, on a on a Skype call right back when Skype was the thing with my friends and from Jersey, and they're like, "Just who are all these white people in the background? Like all we see is white, white, white." Um, but I got over my fear. I realized they were human beings with their own stories and I found ways to you know, connect with them. But I think what it armed me with was I was able to adapt to different communities. I was forced to, you know, but I was also forced to assimilate. And that was really difficult in the beginning because I didn't dress like they did and I didn't know the bands, you know, that they did. And I wasn't part of it so I found myself at least in college a hard time of finding my people so I stuck with you know I was like Latino and like black kids I was just like oh you look like home so I would try to make (laughs) friends with them uh but yeah I think looking back now it was the best thing that I could have done because of the fact that I just got a vast array of experiences while I was over there like I took full advantage of living in Boston like, despite all the discomfort. Despite all the discomfort, yeah. I moved, you know, out into an apartment. I made a PowerPoint presentation about why it's more cost-effective for me to live off campus than it was off on campus. So, 19 years old, own apartment, you know, with some girlfriends. And then studying abroad, which for a lot of students, you know, you needed to have a certain amount of money for you to go study abroad. And I remember thinking, once again, it's not fair that I can't go study abroad because I can't show 3000 in my bank account. And I couldn't ask my parents for it. So I began working. So I worked all throughout college. I worked um, at an office. And then to be able to go study abroad, 
I was working at a restaurant and at an office at the same time so I could earn enough money to show that I could go study abroad. And this is why you go to school? Yeah. And by this time, just to uh, clarify, did you already commit to law as your degree? Not yet. So my, no, my degree is actually in finance. So yeah. one of the reasons why I chose Wait, BU what? is in finance. My, my degree is in finance. Yeah. Ugh. But the reason that I chose BU is because they had a concentration in business law. So I was like, oh, great. So I don't have to like major in history or political science or English. I could actually take business courses because what I also knew was I wanted to work with businesses because once again, businesses pervade every area of life. Huh. I wanted the broadest level of education, essentially. So it was a great time. I loved Boston University. It was phenomenal. Uh, so you graduated. So now you're what? Four years in. The... The woman that started there by the time that he graduated, what's uh, what's one high, what's your high and what's your low in that, in that time period? Yeah, so I think my, my like one of my lowest points, like between in, in yeah, college, yeah. I think one of my lowest points was when during that time when I was working two jobs and I realized that. I'm spending most of my time by myself. And I was taking public transportation super late at night and I was always alone because I was one of the only people that worked. Like Boston University is a school where there's a lot of wealth, an enormous amount of wealth. So there weren't a lot of kids that worked. And that's actually where cannabis came into play for me um, is because I began to really consume more and consume alone. Whereas when I first started, it was socially. And then I began to consume alone because it really helped with a lot of the anxiety of having to travel at night by myself or go to work and then have to wake up at 6 a.m. just to, you know, to study for a quiz or something along those lines. So I would say that was a pretty, you know, low moment. Um, and my mom even came to visit me one time and she's like, you've just lost an enormous amount of weight. Like, are you eating? Like, do you have enough money to eat? And I was just saving my money and I was eating like granola bars and some like slim fast shakes just to try to like make it through the day um, because I really just wanted to save up so that I could go study abroad. Um, and then I think my one of my highest points in that was being able to I went to Europe for six months. I studied abroad in Ireland and it was an internship program. So they asked you, where do you want to intern as well? And I was like, well, a law firm. So I went Why? to go. Well, because I was already pursuing, About I knew I was going to go to law school. So I figured like, let me see what like international law kind of looks you, like. <laughs> Did you do that senior year? That was my junior year. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Ireland was amazing. And I went to about eight different countries while I was there. So all the money that I saved up, I blew it all <laughs> in Europe. Compl like all of it. Yeah, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to have like that experience. I studied for four months I studied finance there at their school at University College Dublin and then I spent two months working at a law firm there and it was awesome. Wow. It's cool. Was that uh was that when you were in Prague? That yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. One of those times. Prague was a Prague was at work. No, that was it was just not like work. A, no, that, that was, was fun. Like no, I did happened. I did four countries in twelve days. What for? Hmm? What for? I did Prague, I did Amsterdam, I did Berlin, and what was the other one? I believe the other one was London. Huh. How was Amsterdam? It was awesome. I love It was Amsterdam. really great. It was, it was like chill. a little fairy tale land. You know, everybody just on the their canals, bikes, going to the their cafes, yeah. smoking their weed. So yeah. It was great. Like you love that. So you come back from there, and then what's the, what's the next move? So... You're graduating, and now it's like law schools. Law school. An another adventure that awaits you in in a in a beautiful life of just perseverance. What law school? How'd you decide? Yeah, I went to Suffolk Law in Boston. Um, hey, I you, chose ain't, you, were, you weren't leaving Boston. Listen, I thought I was going to live, work, and die in Boston. Really? That was my goal. I was going to stay here. Nobody's going to take me out of it. I just loved it oh, so you much. You totally hated this place. 
res- I resented it. I really, really did. Um, so when I was in Boston and I ended up going to law school there and I chose my law school, um, one, um, because they gave me a scholarship to go Two, they were very well known for intellectual property, which oh. is what I knew I wanted to pursue in law because I thought it was wild that you could protect something that tangibly doesn't exist. And to me, it was mind blowing that you could do something like that, right? So ideas are not protectable, but the manifestation of that idea is yeah. protectable. So I really liked it. So that's why I decided to go to that law school. And I worked at the same restaurant that I worked in, in undergrad. I worked also throughout law school. Oh my God. And then during this time, are you visiting Jersey? Are you, are friends from here going to see you in Boston? I've, I've kept in touch with a lot of my friends. Um, some of my childhood friends I've known since I was 10 years old. Some I've known since I was like five years old. Um, awesome. Some came up um, and it was funny. One of them, we were walking along the streets of Boston. He goes, I feel my credit score rising up every block <laughs> that I'm walking here. Holy shit, Jess. Like, where are you? You know, because it was different for them too to see, you know, a place like that. But... I, I really did love it, but I think the universe had obviously had other plans for me to, to come back home. So you're at uh, Suffolk Law smoking hella weed? Smoking a lot of weed. I was the one who had weed. I was the one, if you needed weed, I could procure you some weed. My locker smelled like weed. I was charging my <laughs> vape in all the clinic classrooms. But I always did really well, you know, in, in law school. And at that time in law school, I also had like half of my hair was blue and purple. Oh, you got yeah, a pick? So, hmm? you got a pick? Not on me. Um, but can you but can you share a pick and we can do an overlay? Uh, to the maybe episode. if I can find one, uh, if I can find one. <laughs> but yeah, so I was a little bit more on the alternative side of huh, things. What, in uh, what was your, what, what were you listening to at that time? Was I listening to yeah. at that time? I've always been a you know I really I've always really liked like MGMT, Empire of the Sum, Daft Punk is by far you know my favorite. Yeah. But honestly, I just kept to myself a lot in law school. I just found it to be safer because if I went from Boston University, which is a lot of wealth, to a law school now, that was a whole different level of wealth that I saw. So much so that when I would tell people where I'm from, they'd be like, Jersey City? Isn't that like kind of ghetto? And I was like, um, I don't know if that, whatever your definition is, people ask me, so do you carry around a knife? Wow. And I remember just being so appalled, you know, like by that question, because that's how they saw, that's how they saw me. That's how they saw, you know, where I came from, which just added more to the resentment of me coming from, you know, this certain place. So interesting experience, but I had an epiphany in law school. I was one day sitting in the atrium and I was thinking about how I just felt so unprepared compared to my classmates who had, who had families, lawyers, judges, deans. So they were going to get a job, you know, no problem. And I just remember sitting there and thinking, but you know what? I've been through a lot of shit and I really fought my way and we ended up at the same place. But you just had a lot more. You had a head start. You had all these advantages in your corner that I didn't. But we're still in this same class, taking the exact same courses. That's when my mindset really started to change around my Latinidad and where I grew up. What uh, what were you doing at the atrium? I was just sitting. I was just sitting down there just looking at the law school. I remember thinking like, holy shit, I, You're here. I, I'm finally here. Yeah. And the, so that some like, <laughs> without that resentment, without those experiences who's to say you would have gone those places um so that's pretty cool that moment you know if we had like uh an animation we'd, we'd be sketching out the atrium and then you're there just looking up and then like huh <laughs> ghetto <laughs> <laughs> um from there is there anything that started to form around interest in in the cannabis and equity and regulatory or were you just ip trademark let me get a dope ass job and i'm gonna stay in boston what what, that was the move the move for me was to do intellectual property law stay in boston work as a lawyer there and pretty much come back to jersey on like vacations and holidays 
But I used to joke about being a weed attorney. I joked about it for years. Everybody be like, what are you going to be? I'm like, a weed attorney. Because that's how ridiculous I thought it was. That's how (laughs) far-fetched and out of this universe did I ever think that such a profession could exist. Because my first year being a law student, there was a law firm hiring as an associate for cannabis research. And I was like, lit, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And I took it to a student advisor, a career advisor, and she said, do you really want cannabis to be the first thing on your resume? Do you understand how that can implicate your financial opportunities moving forward? What? So I'm like, listen, is my fr- I'm, I'm in you know I'm in law school now. It's my first year. I am in no position to implicate my financial opportunities because I'm in debt from BU and I'm about to be in debt from law school. So I didn't apply, and that was in 2013, and I didn't apply. So I always wonder, you know, what it would have been like um, had I just sort of told her, like, well, you know respectfully, I'm just going to do my own thing. Uh, And that also was a very big teaching moment for me about how not to listen to anybody else's advice when it comes to your own vision, because your vision is yours. You got to protect it. It's not their vision. So it's your responsibility to protect it. Right. And then, like I said, it's always the one with weed. Real real quick. Shout out to that student advisor at (laughs) Suffolk law. Yeah. Uh, You know the name. We don't know yours, but we, you, but we, we know her name and a lot of people know her name. <laughs> so. Yeah. So it wasn't really until I moved back to Jersey that it actually what, became what did a you move back? Like after law school? So after law school. So I couldn't find a job in Boston. I was rejected from 52 jobs. I got three rejection letters in one day. I remember just opening up my mailbox and just laughing my ass off. Because what else could I do? I was either going to break down or I was going to start laughing. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't find a job here. I was in the top 8% of my class. I was on a journal. I've done the clinic work. Like I did everything that I was supposed to do and more. And nothing. Nobody wanted to hire me. I would get to the last round and it was always, sorry, we got to give it to the partner's son. Sorry, you know, somebody else, you know, came in who knows somebody here. And that's when I started to realize, like, oh, this has nothing to do with how prepared I am or what I did, but everything to do with who you know. So I remember speaking to a mentor. She was a Latina lawyer. And she went, mijita, I'm going to tell you something. Nobody's going to find you hiding under a rock. So you need to get yourself out there. How many networking events have you gone to? And I was like, none. She was like, you need to start immediately going. And so that was phenomenal advice that really propelled me to start getting myself out there when I started to realize like they weren't going to give a shit about my grades or my story. And I even went to a professor and I said, I'm not getting these jobs. Why am I not getting these jobs? And she said, can I be honest with you? You don't look like a lawyer and you don't sound like a lawyer. She goes, you look like a pretty girl carrying law books. So if I were you, she goes, I would change my appearance a little bit. She goes, maybe, you know, for them to start taking you a little bit more seriously. And I'm just like, I'm just so baffled by Uh this. And then she told me, you don't wear your story. And she's like, she's mentioned another Latino kid who was in my law school class with me. And she said, he wears his story. He tells everybody his story about where he came from, about how he had to persevere, everything. She goes, you don't. And I said, so I have to leverage what I went through in order for me to get a job. And she said, or else everybody's just going to see you as a pretty face. But at that time, I couldn't talk about how I grew up without crying. I couldn't talk about the resentment that I felt. I couldn't talk about like my mom sacrificing. I couldn't do any of that without crying. So I had to start training myself to package my story so that I can tell people that I'm way more than what they're just looking at because it looked like my resume was not telling that story. Had you, all. had you, I'm so stuck on like these, these feedback sessions that you've had. Yeah. Um, uh, how'd you feel with what that lady shared? Like what, what were your thoughts at least at, at that time versus? I was confused. I just thought that my resume and my work would speak for itself. But when I consider the fact that the legal field is male dominated, so all of my interviewers were men. I hardly had any female interviewers. And so I spoke to two, uh, I spoke to two male 
attorneys and I said, is, is what she said true? And they both said like, your looks are distracting. And so what am I supposed to do really about that? You know, they were like, maybe put your hair back, you know, a little bit, maybe sort of, you know, dim down, you know, like what it is. He's like, obviously your tattoos, you're going to have to hide, you know, perhaps, you know, the hoop earrings may not be the thing that you want to wear. And so I'm now being taught Holy. and guided to change now how I look. And now you, and then you sort of think about this, about how I feel about where I came from and it's being reinforced by the people that I'm asking to hire me. Oh. Yeah. You all right? You get? Yeah. <laughs> so now 52, over 52. Over 52. And when did you decide? How did you decide? I'm going to go back to Jersey. And what was the, what was the thinking? What was the plan? Say, you I know? had to decide because as a lawyer, or as a law student, come like February, March of your last year of law school, you have to decide which bar exam you're going to take. And these bar exams are specific to states. So I had to choose. I either take the Massachusetts bar exam or I take New York's and slash New Jersey. And I'm like, if I don't have a job here in Massachusetts, I can't afford to stay here. So why would I can't take a, I can't do it. So my mom said, take the New York and come back home and you can live with me. And that to me was, holy shit, I fucking failed. I failed. I failed. That's how I saw it. And that's a choice that I had to make. And so I came back September of 2016 and I was a mess. Like my friends will tell you, I was a complete mess. I was super angry about being here, extremely resentful at the universe, just so angry, telling the universe, I did everything you asked me to. I did everything correctly. How could you bring me back here? And so I remember I would like, I was trying to find a job here and here in Jersey, which is, you know, all about connections, all about politics. They were like, who the fuck are you? And I didn't have a network down here. So people didn't want to hire me for a few reasons. One, they were like, well, why couldn't you get a job in Boston? And two, I hadn't passed the bar exam yet because it takes three months to get your results. So they weren't going to take a shot on me. So I had no choice but to say, you know what? My Latina mentor told me nobody's going to find me hiding under a rock. I got to get myself out there. So I went to one networking a week, event a week for four months. I even attended like some like Russian Jewish like bar association event because I was like, maybe somebody here has a job for me. So that helped me get out there, learn how to once again package my story get into circles, start talking to people, start getting my network, you know, up and running. Um, so it taught me a lot. But if you think about the fact that I'm now six months post-graduation with no job, living back at my mom's house. 2016. 2016. Who, uh, who took that uh, fateful shot, uh, fateful, fateful chance on you? Um, so my also, my, my legal career has also been very interesting. Um, so we are now in 2023. I have been to seven law firms in six years. So a lot of bouncing around, a lot of being deemed problematic at law firms, a lot of call in race, like a lot of racism and discrimination out at certain law firms that I've been to. But one of the first people who I guess kind of sort of gave me a shot, he hired me for about a week and a half and then fired me. So that was not fun at all because now I got my first legal job and I'm very excited. And then I have to come back home to my mom with, you know, my little like box and say, well, I got fired. <sighs> According to him, he's like, I, we thought we were bringing in more clients and we just didn't. So can't afford to really have you here. Within a week? Within a week and a half. I feel like I call it bullshit. So unclear. Um, but now I'm back on the job search find another job. They completely lie to me about what they're hiring me for. The amount of verbal abuse that happened there was just absolutely New York. inappropriate in Jersey. And so I was only there for about two and a half months. Um, and then I left and then I went to another law firm and then just kind of kept bouncing around until I found a law firm that actually supported my vision and who I was. And it took a very long time to get here. 
<sighs> I just want to sit with this for a minute because I, I never do. And it's incredible. Um, that's funny. I think there was a comment that you made before. Like, I don't know. If you, you're going to remember I said when I had asked you what you got going on. And I was like, oh, man. Just trying to work harder, trying to be like you. She's like, yeah, yeah. Put in a lot of work to be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of fighting, a lot of self-advocacy, which is what I really try to teach a lot of people is how to become your own best advocate because I realized like nobody was going to fight harder than I was going to fight for myself. And, um, and how long ago, uh, how long ago with a firm that you stuck, stuck with and then how does uh, advocating for cannabis come into play so now you're now you're like fighting for your own professional career correct and then where where yeah. the tide start like where so, the universe start like so the third making, law third law firm. yeah the third law firm um that i go to and they're like you're gonna do labor and employment and that's how it is for that's how it is for law students is and lawyers your first job they tell you this is what you're gonna do if you get to choose extremely lucky but extremely rare but I knew they had an IP department. So I like just went to the IP partner and I was like, listen, no one's got to know, but I'll do work for you. Like under the table, I'll do work for you because I just want to learn. So a lot of the partners there didn't even know that I was working for multiple partners at one time. And so <laughs> this firm had a cannabis practice group, but were they going to let me be a part of it? No. And that's where my fighting really began. And I wanted to be a part of the cannabis group and I wanted to learn. And one of the partners there completely shut me out and did what he could so that I was not a part of it. And one day I really wanted to take this course on ethics in for being a cannabis attorney because I'm violating federal law every single day of my <laughs> life. So I want to understand how to protect myself. And the firm said, no, we're not going to pay for that. And I was in the car and I was so frustrated because I'm just trying to do the right thing here. I'm trying to build a practice area, get clients in, doing more than whatever a first year associate would do. And you get a decap by your own. And my mom, once again, comes to the picture and I'm like in the car coming home and I'm crying out of frustration. I'm like, they don't want to support me. And she said, do you really need this course? I said, yes, I really need this course. How much is it? I'm like, it's like $180, mom. She said, then you pay for it. And you do it on your own and you stop relying on that firm to help you and you do whatever you can do to make a name for yourself by yourself. And that's what I did. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Nobody here wants to support me. I'm going to start going to events. One of the biggest events was MJ Biz in Vegas. It's like the biggest cannabis conference in the world. The firm said, you can't tell anybody that you're going. And if you could just not talk to anybody about it, and I was like, um, I'm going on my own vacation time. I'm paying for it myself. I'll tell whoever the fuck I want. They were very upset about the fact that I was going out there speaking on cannabis, doing these things because I just stopped asking for permission. I wasn't going to let these crusty old white dudes put me in a box and tell me what I can and cannot do. So they penalized me for it. And they said, if you don't work 500 more hours, you're not going to be eligible for a raise. And I was already working more hours than my white counterparts. So I said, I called him in for a meeting and I was like, I, if you can't give me any other reason, I'm calling you out on racial discrimination. And they were like, oh no, Jess, you know, like it's really not like that. I said, then what other reason can you tell me for your only Latina lawyer here at the firm to have to work 500 more hours than my white counterparts in my same position? What is the rationale? And they couldn't give one to me. So listen, you call somebody out for that like, you got to get up and go. And that's what I did. I got up, I left, and I formed my own law firm with another Latina lawyer of mine because the job that I wanted didn't exist, so I created it. <sighs> so now if you can imagine going to my mom. Shout out to Sylvia. And, tell, and telling, telling my mom, <laughs> I'm quitting my job to start a law firm in cannabis. By the way, mom, it is not legal here on the state or federal level just yet, but it will be. That was the opening to my family of, oh, Jessica smokes weed. Jessica works in weed. So no one in my family asked me about my job or my career for about six months. Nobody wanted to know everything. How long ago was that? And this was, this was 2018. 2018. 
And then was that was that when you started the tour? When you started doing the work? I had one, you know, I I never sought out to have my own law firm. That wasn't ever like a dream of mine. I did it out of pure necessity. Because yep. I figured if I go to another law firm, they're just going to put me behind another computer and tell me, bill out these hours. And yes, you can do something. You can't do anything. And so I used that year, uh, which I lost a ton of money, by the way, lost a ton of money that year. But I gained it all in experience. I became my own IT person, my own marketing person, my own billing person. I learned how to you know, interact with other areas of the law. I took on clients that I wanted to take on. Some I took on pro bono. I was doing teaching, speaking engagements. I could go testify before any municipality, before any state body, and nobody could tell me yes or no. So I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to take this year and I'm going to do whatever I want that requires no permission from anybody. So it was, you know, I asked my mom about, I think uh, about a year ago, I said, looking back now when everybody thought I was insane, what do you think about my decision? And she said, I think that was the best decision you could have made for your career to go out on your own when everybody told you that you were insane for doing it. So by the end of that year, so now we're coming up at the end of 2019, I kid you not, I had about like $300 to my name. Like that was it. And so thankfully I had a really, you know, supportive partner, but like I said, I, you know, I lost a lot of money uh, because people either wouldn't pay you or, you know, things of that nature. And that's what I also learned as well. But it was it was a really good year. It was cool. It was hard, but it was really rewarding. And then, uh, oh my god! And then, and then, uh, and then we get smacked with COVID. And then COVID happens, and at that point, I get recruited to build out a cannabis group at another law firm. <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna go and build this out." But I told him I was like, "It needs to be on my terms and how I want to do it." You know, not the case uh, once you get there. So um, I was only there for about a year and a half um, before I left again. And you're still networking. People know you now. People are bringing you in. Um, when was the point when you started, like, going around the country when you were working on there was some kind of advocacy that either a bill or... Yeah, so I, I mean, my advocacy really started in 2018. Um, and then I've helped advise, you know, about seven different states at this point on social equity efforts. So I joined national organizations, Minorities for Medical Marijuana, the Minority Cannabis Business Association that were national organizations. So I got access to a lot of national policy work and people who were doing this type of work. And uh, there was this one woman, her name is Shalene Title, and she was a lawyer. Uh, and I saw her one day and I'm like, wait, she's a lawyer and she's out here advocating for social equity and social justice. Like I can do that. I had no idea that I, as a lawyer, could do that. I just saw, like, a lawyer that had to be behind a desk pumping out billable hours. So she really inspired a lot of my work and really gave me the courage to really go out there and fight for what I thought was correct. What was her name? Shalene Title. Is she still a lawyer? She's She is a lawyer. She's now the organizer of the what's called the Parabola Center. And so they work on federal cannabis policy for small businesses. So. Oh. We want to shout her out. Yeah, so shout out to Shalene Title and the Parabola Center. Whew. We're coming up to where we're at now. And, uh, oh, man, so grateful for your journey. <laughs> and grateful for you to step through that. So at what point, right, because we've gotten, we're getting closer to present day. You did share, and, I, and, I was, and, I, and I'm going to ask you now, how you started packaging your story of where you're from and how's that resentment meter? So it took, you know, really, I think only probably in the last maybe three, four years is when I really started to like embrace my Latinidad and where I grew up. And it happened because of cannabis, because I started to walk into these rooms where cannabis conversations were happening. And I'm like, um, you guys don't come from where I come from and you guys don't know what these communities are going through, but you're trying to make policy for them without even talking to them, without even including them in the conversation. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell this, I'll tell this story, but I always tell people, I don't follow my example. Um, but I mean, if you want to, but at your own risk, but one of my first speaking engagements that I got was in 2018 and it was happening here in Jersey city. 
And I went up to one of the organizers of the event, who's still a very good friend of mine, and he always re- recalls his story. And I went up to him and I said, you know you're in Jersey City, right? And he's like, yeah. And I said, then why the fuck do you have only white people up there on this stage talking about cannabis policy? And he goes, who are you? And I was like, I'm Jess Gonzalez. I'm an attorney. (laughs) And he goes, great. And I go, and I'm from Jersey City. And he was from Bayonne. And he was Dominican. I was like, and I'm Ecuadorian. And he goes, you want to be up on stage then? I said, yes, I do. He said, great, you're going to be up on stage next month then. Tell me what you want to talk about. And I was like, oh, shit. And so at this point, like, I'm still just getting, you know, my feet wet in cannabis. Like, I don't know if I was in any position to be going up there talking about it. (laughs) But that was my first, you know, intro. And people still remember me from that speaking engagement. So I tell people, like, it was a black man and a Latino man who gave me my first speaking gig. And they opened up a lot of doors for me because that stage at the time was a very prominent stage. And so... I started to understand that if I don't leverage the privileges that I have, which is I am, I'm a lawyer, so I understand I protect myself. I'm a citizen. I became a citizen when I was eight years old. And I speak English, which as you know, a lot of members of our community don't. So if I have these three privileges and I don't leverage them, then what the fuck am I doing? Like, why did I become a lawyer in the first place? So that's when I decided, I said, well, if nobody else is going to speak up and there was just no lawyers talking about social equity at all, I was like, I'm going to step into this conversation. I'll take on that load and I'll really start trying to see how we can get our communities involved in the conversation. So obviously I now have to embrace my background. I have to embrace the community that I resented for so long and I have to embrace my culture and my heritage which is something I'd never really had to do. But that was the catalyst as to how I really began to inform myself. But then I started to get criticized by some people who didn't know my story and who assumed that because of the way that I speak and the way that I dress and my title, that I came from money. So they would say, you are too bougie. You come from money. You don't understand these communities. You have no right to be advocating for social equity, you should give that spot to somebody else. So I'm like, oh, well, now a second time in my life, somebody's telling me you don't wear your story. So then I began to understand I have to tell this aspect about myself now or else somebody else is going to create a narrative about me that isn't true. So then I finally understood the power of telling your story and being the narrator of your life rather than giving that power to somebody else. So I started to talk about where I came from, how I grew up, like no money, you know, like going to things by myself, the gangs, the police, things that were happening. And that's when I felt I began to be embraced more by the community. And I started to see that people really resonated with the story and the journey. I was just always too afraid to tell it. Yeah. And now anybody asks me and I will, you know, completely let them know and I can do so, you know, without crying and I can do so without any resentment. And now I have such an appreciation for my culture and I have such an appreciation for Jersey City and the fact that it, it carved me, you know, it formed me. All I'm thinking about is that, that mentor of yours that said, Bihita. No one's going to find you under a rock. And I tell people that all the time. I'm like, you got to go out there. You got to tell your story. You got to tell people, you know, who you are. That comes down to, you know, and then there's branding and there's marketing and there's a storytelling about it. And it's one thing that I just really have been trying, you know, practicing for the past, you know, few years. So now when I go to events, people are saying, or like when I came here today and you were like, you look like you're everywhere and doing everything, you know, what's going on. And people tell me this all the time. And it's like, it's true because People sometimes say, like, I'm too shy to, you know, and I don't want to flex and I don't want to do this. Like, fucking flex. Like, what do you mean? If you worked for it, right, there's like a big difference. Obviously, you stay humble, but being proud of your achievements is something that I think, especially in the immigrant community, especially in the Latino community, we've been taught, keep your head down, stay quiet, don't ask for more, and keep it moving. And I just don't see that benefiting us anymore at all our stories need to be told we need to be loud we need to be out there or else what's going to happen people are going to tell our stories for us 
So two more things now that we're at present day. Number one is <clears throat> we did this earlier, but we I don't think we did it on on here. What are you up to? What am I up to? So I'm up I to a couple of d- different. There were five. Or yeah, four. so I'm up to a couple of different things. Um, it's probably one of the most exciting things that I'm doing is working with the New Jersey Business Action Center. Which, if folks aren't familiar with it, it's a business advocacy agency in Jersey. So even for all small businesses, like they'll help you get in contact, you know, with legislators. They will help you, you know, with certain bills that are moving forward. They'll help you with resources. Okay. You need to understand, you know, minority business certification. They're going to help you with that. They'll put you in contact. That's what they are, a business advocacy group. So they've been tasked with spearheading the Cannabis Training Academy, the state's first educational program specifically designated to educate the public, but those that are social equity, legacy, micro business, diversely owned businesses, to be able to understand the cannabis industry and learn how to apply for a license. Uh So... This agency uh, came out with this application process. I applied, and my team and I scored the highest in the state. So we were awarded the state (laughs) contract to build this out. And what a dream come true, really, because what I do is education and advocacy. And essentially what I want with this program is to empower those who want to get involved to make good business decisions. It's not just, hey, here's what you need to learn to get a license, Uh but it's, also, here's enough information protect yourself so that in exactly the protect yourself against predatory practices, right? Protect yourself against any maybe municipal retaliation that you happens. It's all about once again going back to my why, right? I always want to arm myself with the tools to defend myself. That's what I see education as. And that's what I want to do with this program. So it's gonna, you know, hopefully launch. It's gonna launch in 2023. Um, date is still a bit tentative. But it's going to be over 65 courses with instructors and with mentors and, as well. And you're the producer of this And I class. am the lead consultant. Yes. <laughs> so I am shaping this program. And then what I want to do also is, and you'll appreciate this, is create a community out of it too. Because think about it, like how many, like growing up, like did you have a lot of access to lawyers and you know, accountants and consultants and architects and anything. No, right. You had to go out there and search for yourself. And the problem is you probably know the right questions to ask. You didn't know who to trust. And so what we're doing here with this program is we are vetting all instructors and mentors to make sure that you're coming in with the best of intentions. You have experience and success in your related field. And most importantly, that you can teach it. There's a lot of people who can do really great things. Can they teach it is something completely different. So what I want is for the community now have access to these vetted mentors and instructors. So they have the trust of knowing these are not some shady ass people. These are people who went through a vetting process that we're creating and to make sure that, look, now you have access. So you need a lawyer, you need an account, you need an architect, you need a marketing person. You need somebody to, you know, write your standard operating procedures. Here they are. That's also what I want to provide is to be that bridge, not just to education, but a community of service professionals. That's phenomenal. Yeah. That's the only thing that you're working on, right? Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> uh, so I still am a lawyer, practicing lawyer, which I do the primarily trademark law. So I help cannabis brands around the country protect you work for their a firm? trademark. I do work for a firm. I work for the Rudick Law Group, and it is an all female firm, female owned as well, uh, just launched in January. Of this year, yeah, and you know, really big shout out to my team. I'm not, um, just part time there as an associate, but really big shout out to my team and shout out to really my boss, Lauren, who has been that's why I've stuck with her now. She's now going to be the person in my legal career that I have stuck with the longest in terms of bouncing around because she has never had me to argue for my vision. I have just brought my vision to her, and she's like, Great. Go execute. Full support. What do you need in order for you to do that? So I feel very thankful that, you know, it took me almost five and a half years to find her. But she's played a very integral part in helping me do this because, you know, not many law firms would have been like, hey, by the way, I'm going to go apply for the state contract. So I'm going to have to go part time. Uh, Thanks so much. She said, absolutely. You do what you got to do. So, yeah. So I still do the trademark work, things on, on that. And then I teach Hudson County Community College. I teach the history of cannabis. 
And then at Rowan University, I teach a cannabis policy course. And my students are the best. They are so funny. When, uh, when do you sleep? I get a lot of sleep. What? I don't compromise sleep for anything or anybody. I am in bed <laughs> by 10, 1030, and I'm like a child. I'm like an infant. I need like eight to 10 hours of sleep in order for me to function appropriately. So I get a lot of it. And then uh, I feel like there's something missing. Well, I still continue to advocate. Yeah. Yeah. So policy advocate. So I still continue to work on that. So a lot of speaking, engagement, working, you know, if there's any bills that are coming through, providing my uh, content. Or for example, I have some friends who are like, hey, I need to convince a town to give me municipal approval for my application. Will you come help and support us? So I'll go and I'll go and I'll speak on behalf of them. Tell them who I am, why I think they would be a really great fit. So yeah, I'm also helping out a lot of my friends who need help. You're you're speaking in DC soon. What do you got? I'm speaking at the National Cannabis Festival, and I'm speaking on predatory practices wow. and ha- so giving tips and tricks for how to properly negotiate. Once again, just how to be your own best advocate. Um, and then yeah, that's a, just one of my few speaking engagements that are happening. Um, and then super happy that I'll be going to, um, it's called a global conference, um, on cannabis policy and drug enforcement, really relating to social equity legacy that's going to be taking place in Prague. So I've been invited to go there and represent the U S on these talks. Does it feel like night and day? How so? The climb? Oh, um, you know, when I got this email about this global conference, I thought it was spam because that's how ridiculous I thought that it was until it was actually Shaleen who texted me and said, did you get the invitation? And I'm like, holy shit, this is real. And this only happened like three days ago. So I called my mom up at like 930 at night, like I'm going to Europe to speak on social equity in the U.S. with global leaders from around the world. I said, mom, did you ever think that my career would take me here when I first told you what I was going to do? Like, to me, it's just so wild, but I've been consistent with it. And my intentions have always been, I just want to learn so that I can teach. So I'm really looking forward to going there, learning, absorbing information and coming back here and talking to people about not just what's happening in the U.S., but what's going on around the world with social equity and cannabis. Yeah, so the story, so rocky, so many edges, and now you get to, like, round it out, particularly next year, right? So, yes, uh, so, so very interesting. That's going to be fun. So, next year, I am going to be going to South America, back to Ecuador, to where I was born, and to really go in there and learn Spanish fluently. And I mean, like, learning policy, law, regulations in Spanish. I mean, right now, learning, you know, reading law and regulations is like a whole different language in English in and of itself. So now trying to do it in Spanish. And that way, I can also come back here to educate my community. Because one thing that does pain me is that I can't educate my Latino community here in Spanish. And I can't do interviews in Spanish. Not yet. Because I get very nervous. Not yet, exactly. And so when I went to Ecuador a few weeks, um, back in October, and I was around the dinner table, and somebody's like, hey, so marijuana and cannabis, those are two different things, right? And I'm like, no, and let me tell you why. But it was so difficult for me to say it in Spanish and to tell them the history of it and why we why we use the word marijuana in the first place and how it came to be. And it pained me. It was really heartbreaking for me to sit around that dinner table with my tias and my tios and unable to relay the message in the way that I wanted to because I pride myself a lot on how I communicate. So the fact that I couldn't do it was heartbreaking. And that's when I really fully said, no, I got to come back here. I really have to educate myself in their culture and their language and their laws and their regulations and then start helping out my friends there who are advocating for legalization. No, and, uh, and ChatGPT wasn't around at that dinner table. It was not as not around at that dinner table. I wish it would have been. <laughs> you know, so we're, we're, we're coming to the close. Uh, the last thing that I, the last question that I'll ask uh, 
and I ask everybody that comes on here is it's the year 2023. What is your word for the year? My word for the year. Take your time. You'll appreciate this. Generate. Huh? Generate. Generate? <laughs> yes. What's it mean for you if you want to share with, with folks if they know they know? You know, I hired a spiritual coach last year to help me with this decision for Ecuador. Because I knew I could prepare for it externally. But internally, if I wasn't going to be preparing for that shift, something may get in the way. And one thing that she taught me was about my human design and how she said, you've been spending your entire life acting like a manifester when you're really a generator. Uh. So we worked together for a few months and I really started to internalize a lot of the teachings and really started to understand, you know, how my energy works and how I attract what I attract in a certain way and why maybe when I was trying to make things happen and forcing things to happen, it just yeah, wasn't yeah, working. Yeah, and no I was, way. I was depleted, right? And I was unmotivated and I was disappointed. And so learning about being a generator and what that actually means has helped me tremendously in terms of getting more rest, in terms of saying no to things that I really didn't want to do, but I thought I had to do starting to say yes to things that maybe don't make the most amount of sense at that time, but something in me tells me to do it. So I'm looking at this year also like my bridge year between sort of who I am and who I'm about to become when I leave to Ecuador, right? Like I'm always saying like, I don't know who 2025 Jessica is going to be. She's going to be, she's going to be a political candidate. So excited <laughs> to meet her. And what that's going to be like. So I just want to generate in this year and to put all my energy into these amazing projects that I have been tasked with and to bring a lot of my energy into also helping my friends build what they have to build and taking advantage of the fact that I'm only in this country, you know, for the next like, you know, like eight months. Obviously, you know, I'll be coming back but doing as much as I can here so that I can also leave New Jersey in the canvas industry and say, all right, I've done what I've came here to do. I'm going to leave for a little bit, but I've left it hopefully in a pretty good state for me to come back to and just help and to make it better when I come back with these new skills that I'll have. You're an inspiration. Thanks. Thanks for being a dope ass friend. Thanks for being a superhero. Thanks for being from here. Thank you for resenting this place, going out into the world, fighting, coming back, embracing, and being an example uh, for others. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having thanks me. Thanks for coming in. Letting me share my story. Absolutely. There we have it. Jessica Gonzalez, rock star, superhero, Jersey City Zone. It's a wrap. Showtown. Showtown.